Tonight, uh, the star of the evening is Barca Dutt. Um, Barca will talk about her work of reporting on the coronavirus pandemic in India. Uh, I want to say that uh, we need to recognize there's some harsh stuff in this and some really uh, uncomfortable and tough material here. So I just want to flag that there'll be some images here uh, that are quite disturbing because this is a tough situation and I want to just to recognize that so people are aware of what they're going into. Um, but Barker will tell you much more of the substance of this. Um, I will only say we are so pleased to have you here. It's a real honor. Uh, Barker, as many of you will know, is uh, not just an incredibly accomplished broadcast journalist and editor uh, with many years of experience at NDTV uh, in India. She's also um, the founder of uh, Mojo Story, a digital platform for storytelling uh, that is, I think, a really interesting experiment and initiative in Indian journalism today that she's done important work with in recent years, as well as a columnist for the Washington Post. Um, and, of course, from our humble point of view, particularly delighted to say that she's also a visiting fellow at the Reuters Institute right now. So, Barka, so pleased to have you. It's an honor. We look forward to your lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Michael, Rasmus, Mira, and all of you. It's lovely to see a full room, um, and uh, it, it, it makes me feel that we're going to have not just an important, but what I hope will be a dialogue and not a monologue. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to sharing the life I've lived and spent over the last two years with all of you, both who are present in the room and uh, to everybody who's joining us on the live stream. Thank you, Rasmus, for that. Uh, very generous introduction. Before I get started uh, with this evening's address, I want to put this in context and to talk a little bit about how I've spent the last two years so that what I'm about to show you will make sense. I'm somebody who spent about 20 years in television. And just as I exited the world of big media, uh, I used to work at a television network called NDTV, New Delhi Television. I was an on-air primetime presenter as well as a field correspondent. Uh, I mostly covered war and conflict, uh, and uh, that is really how I cut my teeth as a reporter. And at some point, uh, I decided that I wanted to be a digital entrepreneur. I wanted to start my own platform, and I had just just about registered Mojo Story. Mojo means magic. Um, when we had the beginnings of the COVID pandemic. So we were like a small basement, literally like a basement startup as COVID hit. Uh, a team of four then, a team of 15 today. And um, we were four people, including our driver, who basically at the height of the national lockdown in India in 2020, uh, set out to uncover what was happening in the furthest corners of my country. And the reason that this journey was such an experience was, I think many of you who are not from India may not know this, we had amongst the most draconian, absolutist lockdowns in the world. And the one thing that India did, and you know, we did some things right and some things wrong, like many other countries, everybody was groping their way in the dark. But one of the things we did as a country in the first wave, which we did not repeat in the second wave, is that we shut down public transport. So the reason, in case some of you are wondering, why did I get into a car? Why didn't I just take a train, a bus, uh, 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 an airplane? Is because there were none available. And the only way that you could actually get from point A to point B was if you drove. I was, uh, as a journalist, listed as an exempt essential service, which is how, though nobody else could actually step out, because the media was considered an essential service, uh, we were able to basically step out and tell this story. Finally, what's important to understand is that we called it a lockdown, but it was more like a curfew. In other words, it was a police-enforced lockdown, which meant that a number of people who were literally at the margins of our society um, they didn't just have to fight for survival in a, in a pandemic or fight for survival economically. Uh, they also had to, at many times, battle a very, very draconian police force. And that created all sorts of social challenges 
that were quite unique to India. This was how my journey with COVID uh, began. And of course, by the time the second wave, in many ways, which was much more lethal, it was the Delta wave, uh, hit us, public transport was not closed. And this time I was able to fly across to major cities and then take a car from there and drive into um, <clears throat> the sort of remote rural interiors of India. So that has been my, my two years. It has also been an extremely personal journey for me. Uh, at some point in the second wave, I became the story I was reporting. Uh, I had spent months reporting on other people who were battling the system, fighting for hospital beds, fighting for oxygen, fighting for ambulances, fighting for space at cremation grounds and burial grounds. When all of this happened to my own father, uh, in the middle of the second wave, I lost my father to COVID. and. Um, got COVID the day we cremated him. So it was also a lesson in journalism uh, to see the story suddenly from the other side, to be the story. And that also influenced my telling of the story uh, because suddenly there was no distance between me and the story that I was reporting on. So I just wanted all of you to have this context um, as we get started. Helen back on the road with the pandemic, my two years reporting COVID. So, what happened after this lockdown to India? One of the things they told us globally when COVID was first uncovered is that the virus was what was called the great equalizer. We were given to believe that the virus did not discriminate. It did not discriminate on the basis of class, gender, religion, caste, ethnicity, nationality. And at first, it sounded like the truth. After all, science is driven by facts. Why would the virus pick on some and not pick on the others? And so COVID was described to be that great level playing field for tragedy, for crisis and for crisis management. I believed it at first. And then when I stepped out to tell the story, I actually found that COVID wrenched open every single inequity of my country, and I'm sure this was true for other countries as well, but since I'm here to talk about India, it wrenched open every single inequity of economics, of, of you know, inequalities based on gender, how this virus played out for women and men, how it played out for cities and villages, how it played out for people who are called upper castes compared to those who live at the bottom of our caste hierarchy, how it played out for the rich, and how it played out for the poor. And along the way, it created new inequities. So it held a mirror to our existing inequities, and then it created new stratifications in an already divided, highly stratified society. The first image that you see came to be the defining image of the first wave. We were perhaps the only country in the world where the humanitarian crisis threatened to be larger than the medical crisis. And here's what happened. We have millions of people called migrant workers. What does this mean? It means that there are people who can't find any work in the villages, and they come to the cities to live for work. But the city is not their home, so they often don't have any permanent residence, any permanent source of employment. So for instance, a migrant worker typically could be working in a factory or at a construction site where he or she will live for a few months on that project site, will not have any permanent sort of place to live, and then will go back to the village when he or she gets time off, but is essentially a daily wager. What are the minimum wages in India? Any, any guesses? Anyone? Anyone? I, I, I see some Indian faces in, in, in the hall. So any guesses what our official minimum wage is in many parts of the country? It's less than two pounds a day. Now imagine losing that. Imagine losing less than two pounds a day in the middle of a crisis where just like the rest of us who feel the need to be with people we love and people we know, so there is also that psychological need, you suddenly lose that 170 odd rupees that you earn in a day, if you get that at all, because everything has shut down. So you don't have a place where you can turn to for food. Your landlord is not willing to waive off the rent. You're desperately worried because often your children are back home in the village or your parents are back home in the village and there's no public transport and you're scared as shit. So what do you do? You start walking. You start walking. And if it means walking a thousand kilometers, then you walk 
a thousand kilometers. And I remember going to the borders of India's capital the morning after the Prime Minister announced at four hours notice that India was going into lockdown just to see what was happening. And I was absolutely staggered because I saw men, women, their little children, almost like their entire universes had been packed into these little, what we say in Hindi, potli, which is like literally, literally a piece of cloth that holds their belongings together carried on their heads. And so began the great exodus. Millions of people, millions of people walked home in those first 30 odd days as the lockdown continued to be in place. And they were factory workers, cement workers, people who worked in, in, in the fields, in remote rural villages, weavers, uh, potato farm, not farmers, but really labor on potato farms and so on. And as you can see, this for me was really a kind of definitive haunting image of the tragedy. They carried their children, their little infants, on their backs like this, and it was very hot. Please also remember that we are from a hot country. This was the month of March and April. The sun was blazing. Many of them walked barefoot, and many of them had left home with a pack of biscuits and a bottle of water and whatever they had made, some roti, some bread for the day. And these images did not trigger an intervention. In fact, it, there was a lot of confusion because initially there was the belief that if we send the workers home in public transport, they'll carry the virus with them. So there was this kind of clumsy initial attempt to send them home in buses. And then because it was so ill-conceived and poorly planned, there was such a throng of humanity at the bus stop and at the railway station that that was hastily withdrawn. And a police order was issued to say that there can be no movement of workers across the border. But when I went to the borders, there was no police present, at least when I saw initially. And you just had this mass exodus. And as you can see, there were women, men, children walking bare feet. These are the poorest of poor in India. And 100 million Indians are estimated to have walked home in that month. And just you know, I don't want to rush through this because I want you all to, to, to have this sort of sink in. Uh, it's a staggering figure. It's the largest mass exodus of Indians since the partition of our country. Um, this is the story of a factory that I went to report on in Delhi. And here's what happened. Some left. Some wanted to leave and weren't being allowed to leave. And these workers were locked inside their factory. And because they had a phone, they managed to record an SOS video for help and put it on Twitter, which is where I spotted it. I then hunted them down and went to the factory and found myself locked in with them because the security guards just basically came and said, what the hell are you doing here? You're not allowed to film here. We went on filming. And uh, this, is how these were the, this is how the workers were locked in behind these, these gates, like caged animals. They were placed behind these gates. And this says in Hindi that they're allowed to step out between 6.30 and 8.30 every morning. They were allowed to go out because there was no bathrooms, there was no food in the factory compound. And the owners of this factory actually thought that they were being benevolent by letting these animals out for, a, in quotes, treating them like animals. It was almost like they were being treated as beasts who were unchained for a couple of hours. It was absolutely horrifying. And we made a huge amount of noise and the factory owners had to unlock the gates and, and, and let them come out. Uh, this is how they were all locked inside, um, in, inside and behind the gates. And then there was another family. This is Seema. And it's important for me to take their names because too often we get lost in statistics and they're not real people for anybody. So Seema and her children and her husband, he's a rag picker. She looks after the children. They made three attempts. By now, as this exodus picked up, the police was placed at the borders, not to enable these workers, but to use force to send them back. And these workers were not ready to stay because when I would ask them, you know, aren't you scared that if you move, you could get COVID? And they kept saying, literally every person said the same thing to me, the poverty will kill us before the virus will. And Seema made three attempts to cross the border to walk home to her village and which was hundreds of kilometers away and each time the police would just pick her up and send her back 
and they ran out of water. So there was this little hose pipe from a public park and they stopped to have water there and she just collapsed in tears. And I felt help, helpless and I didn't know what to do, but I have to tell you all my notions of social distancing were severely challenged when I saw people just collapse. I just could not, you know, they would cling on to me, they would hold my hand, they would hold on to me and I couldn't not but hold on to them as well because I would have just felt inhuman to not do that. And this is Seema just weeping. And it, it, it just felt like they were all of this, this mass of humanity that had been literally orphaned by the state. You know, the state was absent, the institutions, they, the state was either absent or it was overpresent. And let me explain to you what I mean. So either there was the police as an institution, an arm of the state where it did not need to be present, treating this like a curfew, and these poor people like criminals, or there was no state present at all. It, you know, we could have converted petrol gas stations, petrol pumps along the way into night halts. We could have uh, provided food. I mean, we thought of so many things and nobody did it. Eventually, it was civil society groups, good Samaritans, who realized that this great march was taking place on India's highways, otherwise a symbol of our sort of economic development, and then started distributing food. But in that first few weeks, there was no food at all. And the absence of food led to multiple tragedies. This lady's name is Poonam. She was married to a man called Mukesh Mandal. Mukesh Mandal was a house painter. That job sounds grander than it was. What it basically means is that when homes were built at construction sites and somebody had to come and do the odd job of painting a wall, he was requisitioned. He was a daily, wage, da daily wager. Mukesh Mandal had no work. And he was one of the families who wanted to go back, but he didn't even have enough money to organize biscuits or water and be able to walk back home. So he didn't have anything else he owned, but he owned a mobile phone. So he went and pawned his mobile phone, sold it, got a few hundred rupees, bought some grains, some wheat and rice, came and handed it to his wife, and also bought her a table fan because it was very hot. Gave her the table fan, and the next morning, he took his wife's scarf, tied it to a bamboo pole, and took his life. That's him. He was in his early 30s. And that's his family. They live in a shanty, in a slum shanty. And the police, because the state did not want to recognize that there were starvation deaths that were taking place, the police got his father-in-law, Poonam's father, to put his thumb, they're a family that's not literate, they can't read or, or, or write, so a thumbprint was taken from the father-in-law father, father -in -law to say that Mukesh was mentally unsound. The father-in-law did not understand what he had signed. And later when we saw the documents and we took them back to the police, we understood what had happened and we explained to the family, but the family was so terrified. The police basically told them that since this is a case of suicide, if you don't put your thumb on this, you're going to be hauled up. We'll start investigating you. What led to this man's suicide? So they hastily put that, you know, imprint uh, of, of, of the thumb and then started saying we didn't understand, you know, what had happened here. Among the most disturbing things I saw is that while public transport was closed, trucks were allowed to ply to uh, ferry essential supplies like vegetables and milk and, and, and fuel. So what would happen on the highways is if the workers got lucky, a truck driver would agree to give them a little bit of a ride a few kilometers down the highway. And oftentimes, the truck driver was too scared of the police. So he would say no. So you can see here a worker pleading with a truck driver, please take me back. And it was heartbreaking for me to witness this. I witnessed this myself. You had all of these workers chasing after this truck driver, stopping him, waving him down, pleading with him with folded hands, and the truck driver said, no, I'm sorry, I can't do this. The police will completely destroy me. And so they kept walking. Then they walked at night through forest land, under the moonlight. This family walked a thousand kilometers. And I remember this family so well because in the middle of their walk, one of their children started sobbing. And he just said, I can't go on any further. And 
you know, we had some biscuits in our car. We, we gave that child some biscuits, calmed him down. But and these were little children carrying big bags and walking. And then those who were lucky enough to get into a truck, this truck was in Mumbai and it was stopped by the police. And when we looked in, uh, we had to fight with the police and the police was trying to show us away. And we clambered at the back and we looked in and I'll just take you back to what we saw. We saw people packed like sardines, poor people. And again, I said, why are you doing this? You'll, you'll all get COVID. Sitting like this, you're all going to get COVID. And they said, well, we're going to die anyway if we live here. If we continue like this with this lockdown, we're going to die anyway. And we're going to die much quicker than the virus will have us. But through all of this, the workman's dignity, his or her desire to work, to earn a living, never diminished. I often wondered when people have to leave in these circumstances, what is it that they carry with them? What do, what do people carry when they leave in a circumstance like this? And I asked them to show me. And in a plastic bucket, I found that they were just carrying their workman's tools. And somehow I found this image so extraordinarily moving because it captured that, that assertion of dignity, of self-pride, even in the middle of having nothing, of being absolutely impoverished. But you can see their white gloves and their, you know, their, their, their sickle and their hammer and so on, their spade. And this is what they were carrying as, you know, this is when, again, they were trying to get a ride on a truck and they picked up these buckets. And I said, hey, what's in the bucket? And I just want to let that linger on. They were all their tools. This child was nine years old. And uh, this is when buses had opened. We were about two months into the first wave. And I said to him playfully, can you describe for me what COVID is? Do you know, Do you know what the coronavirus is? So, ha, bilkul, in Hindi, of course. So I said, come on, tell me. And he said, I'll say it in Hindi and then I'll translate. He said, COVID ka matlab, mujhe khana nahi milta. COVID means I go hungry. That is how a nine-year-old defined, that is his understanding. He, he didn't even have to think. That is how he defined it. And, you know, for me, it just captured, it captured this giant humanitarian crisis that, that was being lost in caseload numbers and dashboard numbers and hospital beds. And of course, all of that is important, but there are real people. In each of these numbers is a real story, and that story needed to be told. And then there was the elderly and the loneliness of the elderly. And this, I think, happened in other parts of the world as well. We hear really sort of, you know, I, I, I know that one of the reasons that people here are, are so angry about whether Christmas parties took place or not at 10 Downing Street is because there were people who couldn't meet their parents, who couldn't attend funerals, who couldn't meet their grandparents, who thought of their elderly alone, dying, struggling. This was a terrible time for the elderly. And this lady called Leelawati. I met her sitting alone outside a railway station in Bombay, in Mumbai. And I walked up to her and I, I just saw that she was crying. And I, I'd come actually to, to report on what was happening when the trains had finally started for migrant workers. And she was just sobbing. And I started talking to her and she told me that she had been thrown, up, thrown out of her house by her son, who was an alcoholic. And he basically said that he had no work so he couldn't look after the mother, he said, get lost, I don't care where you go. She had nobody else, she had no children willing to take her, and she wanted to get onto a train to Delhi, but she had no money, she had no food. Um, there were some Samar good Samaritans who came distributing little boxes of like a samosa and a, you know, a packet of crisps, and so we got her one of those boxes, and I told her, eat, and she said, I'm not gonna eat, I'm gonna save it for later, because what if I get onto the train, I don't have a single pesa to buy anything, I don't have, a, you know, I need to hoard this. And I said, what are you going to do when you reach Delhi? And she said, well, you know, Delhi is where I lived with my husband. My husband's now dead, but I'm ready to beg. Just get me on that train somehow. And, you know, these were in some ways, I, I, I stopped sleeping at night because my mind would just be sort of haunted by all of these people that I was meeting and nothing that I could say made any sense to them. And even if I was able to help a few with some food or some money, I could not you know, provide institutional support. And secondly, 
I believe that my job as a journalist, and you know, we can talk more about that in Q&A, what was my responsibility to these people, I believe that I, I had to tell a story so powerful that it would shake the system, and I did try and do that to the best of my abilities. But there was so much tone deafness. These grainy images that you see are of a 15-year-old girl, her name was Jyoti, who cycled on that rickety cycle. You can see her belongings in that basket uh, at front, uh, clasped to the front of the cycle. She cycled 1,200 kilometers with her father sitting at the back. Her father just had a knee surgery, so the father couldn't cycle, and they thought maybe cycling is better than walking. So she cycled home. And she, instead of being seen as a, as a, as a, sort of a tragic victim of the, of the crisis, was hailed suddenly uh, as some kind of you know, budding sportswoman. I mean, we were this sort of tone deaf and elite, and Ivanka Trump tweeted about her, about what a discovery she was. And that's when I knew we'd really lost the plot, right? Um, I went to meet her in her, in, in her village. And you know, at least it's a story, a rare story that ended happily. But that a 15-year-old girl had to be put through this, and that we then reframed this as 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 somehow a, a happy story. Uh, you know, when I interviewed her, she told me she cried every single night, and she was terrified. And I can't even imagine what this has done to her sense of well-being. Uh, you know, cycling. Uh, with her father at the back, she was 15 for God's sake, and you know, worried all the time about her safety, her personal safety. And you know, she told me, she said, I'm, I'm a girl, and there were so many men on the road, I didn't know what would happen to me at any point. Uh, but this, I did, when I did go to her, she said, Come on, we must go on a cycle for a little spin. So we did. Uh, it just felt like, you know, grasping some moments of, okay, maybe we'll all heal together. But here's what happened. How many beds do you think India has for every thousand people? Any guesses? 0.55, yeah? So what happened was that when our system got completely consumed by COVID, what did it do to everybody else who was ill? I, I, I'm not sure and I'd be really keen to learn how other countries dealt with this, but instead of focusing on field hospitals and you know maybe having COVID patients segregated in spaces outside regular hospitals. We had hospitals take, taken over. Initially, of course, there was panic. So every time there was a positive case, the hospital would shut down. It would get sealed. And otherwise, the hospital was devoted to uh, the treatment of COVID. So what this did repeatedly, and again, again, I remind you of the original framing of this conversation, uh, how COVID wrenched open our inequities. Again, you would see all of these poor people outside public hospitals, government-funded facilities, but nowhere to go. Nobody was willing to take them in. This was a three-month-old baby with a heart ailment. He needed urgently a heart surgery. There was nobody willing to do it. His father had to. Uh, in, in, in Hindu custom, little children are buried, um, and so he's here, burying his three-month-old, that's his mother. This is Rajesh. Rajesh, as you can see, we've blurred some of these images. I'm sorry, some of these images are disturbing, but this is, you know, we can't look away because we've just been looking away for too long. Oral cancer, needed chemotherapy, couldn't get it. Outside the gates of one of Delhi's public hospitals with his big bag of x-rays and ultrasounds and whatever that he was able to get previously told, we don't know where to send you. Go somewhere. Alone, no family support, no monetary support. And this, a tea vendor dies from tuberculosis. India had hoped to eliminate TB by the year 2025. We have been set back by a few years in that pursuit. This is um, a story that I call Five Girls in a Funeral. The reason that this image is so dramatic is because traditionally in, uh, in India, women are kept away from funerals and cremations. It's mostly the men, um, who, and it's always, if there's a boy in the family, the boy who carries the pile. In this family, there were only girls, and then the girls uh, you know, took the father's body on their shoulder, and they went and they cremated him. 
Once again, he died from tuberculosis because when he tried to call for an ambulance, all the ambulances were uh, taken by COVID. There was no hospital bed available because it was all taken by COVID. Again, these are extremely poor people. I say he's a tea vendor. His shop really um, was like a slab of wood with a blue tarpaulin sheet on it, like literally on the road. And those are his girls who, who cremated him. We spoke about a police enforced curfew. This man drives a rickshaw. When the lockdown was in place, he stepped out and he walked, though he wasn't supposed to be out because he had no money to buy vegetables. And the market, the wholesale market, was a few kilometers away. And he thought, maybe if I walk a few kilometers more, I can buy some vegetables for cheap. Because again, he drove a rickshaw. There was a lockdown. He had no source of income. And the police beat him up and left him in the threw him out of the police van and left him here outside the hospital saying, go get treated. But nobody in the hospital was willing to treat him because, again, they were all taken by COVID. This is how I found him. He was just sitting there sobbing. Beaten. He had wounds. And this is what happened to him. Then the desperation of the workers getting, trying to get home led to accidents. Some of them were at the back of a truck. The truck overturned. They were going back to their village. They thought they were lucky. When they died, this is how their bodies were sent back home in plastic packets put on ice slabs. There was one survivor from this accident whom I remember interviewing, and he said, we have been treated like we are lavaris. Lavaris is a Hindi word that means we've been treated like we are kind of like these parentless people. We belong to nobody like we don't belong to anybody. They sent, you know, he objected, he fought, he was, a, he was a single survivor from this accident, and he said, how can you send the bodies of my comrades, my colleagues back like that? But this is how they were sent. When some of us in the media made a lot of noise, then ambulances were provided for the rest of the journey. Otherwise, this is how they would have traveled home. That's the site of the accident, uh, and when the ambulances finally came. Then this. The trains had started by now, but they were so crowded that not everybody could get onto a train, and the wait was very long. Not everybody had money to buy a train ticket. It cost 700 rupees. Remember, daily wages, 170 odd. Some people borrowed money. Some people sold phones. Other people just walked. They walked. And on this railway track, which is not open for passenger trains, and they thought they could hide from the police, in the middle of the night, the there were a group of workers who were walking back to a remote tribal village and they thought they would rest and a goods train ran them over. At four in the morning, a goods train ran them over as they slept. This is what they carried with them. Last night's dinner is today's lunch. This is what remained of them. They were all killed and these are their widows. In the village, we tracked down the village because the headlines only said 16 men die as goods train crushes them when nobody knew the name of their village, nobody knew their names, and we thought it was very important to find out who were these men. And this is one of the fathers. Then we come to hospitals that started shutting their gates. We've been talking about hospitals shutting their gates to non-COVID patients, but by the time the second wave had started creeping up, up, up on us, hospitals ran out of space for COVID patients as well. And this was a familiar sign outside many of the city hospitals. And it led to really strange situations, really disturbing situations. Uh, pregnant women got the vaccine uh, sort of go ahead very late in India. This was a pregnant woman I met outside a, uh, outside a hospital who had just given birth to a one-day-old child. The child was separated from her, there's the child. Uh, she tried to get into hospital, she couldn't get any hospital, but she couldn't go near her baby. Uh, I interviewed another woman who delivered her child as she was walking home. She delivered her baby on the road, and then she spent that night on the pavement, and then the next morning she got up and she just started walking again. But here's what happened to us in the second wave. Why were hospitals shutting their doors to people, not just because of a shortage of beds, but because of a shortage of oxygen. As some of you know, uh, one of the sort of therapy, therapies that works, we now have 
monoclonal antibodies and we have pills that are being developed, but at this stage in the pandemic, we didn't have any of this. So the only thing that would give relief to a patient and help her or him live was high flow oxygen. And oxygen ran short. And you actually had this macabre scene where gurdwaras, which are normally places of worship for the Sikh community, the gurdwaras normally hold something called a langar, where they distribute free food. Uh, instead of food langars, there started to be oxygen langars at gurdwaras. So you had this, you had people driving their ill because they couldn't get a hospital bed to a gurdwara. Like a, it was like a drive-in oxygen banquet. I, I, I don't know how else to describe it. it, it so you, you'd have these desperate people come in their cars or back, back of rickshaws or however they could come. There would be these giant cylinders on the, on the road. You could go, the mask would be clasped to you, breathe for 30 minutes and then be sent, you know, to, hopefully you had, you had saved a life. And then you had to go and find a hospital anyway. So when you had nowhere else to go, you would come here, get a, like a burst of breath and then be on your way. And this is what happened. Uh, we had patients sleeping in the corridors of hospitals. And when these videos leaked, doctors were very upset because they said, you know, the media is judging us for this. But where else are we supposed to keep the patients? We'd rather them be on, on the floor inside a hospital and be able to get them some help. So please quit your elite media narrative about how this is some sort of medical negligence. It is not medical negligence. It is a system that effectively collapsed. And so you had patients. Um, this family, you can see in the distance, is asleep on a cardboard strip. They would carry cardboard strips from home, lay them out, and make them out to a bed. And this is how, this is how they waited for a hospital bed. These were the despair, despair from hospitals where I called it a modern day death warrant. I met a young boy who, as the oxygen started running out, hospitals understood that they were possibly not going to be able to save lives in the same way. Uh, and they did not want to take responsibility for that. They didn't think it was their fault. They just didn't have enough oxygen. So before you admitted a patient, you had to sign a waiver. You had to sign a waiver saying, if this patient dies from an absence of oxygen, it will not be the hospital's fault. Yeah. So I met young children who had to like, you know, when I say children, I mean like, you know, someone who's 19, someone who's 20, who had to sign what I call modern day death warrants before they, their, their relatives were um, accepted in. And I remember a doctor telling me, it's like, it's like being sent to fight a nuclear war with a stick. Yeah. So these are, and then we come to one of the most contentious conversations that India continues to have. How many people actually died from COVID? Our official number and the actual number, what, any guesses how many times apart there might be? Conservative estimates suggest that 10 times more people have died in India, 10 times more um, than is officially uh, sort of asserted. And just to put this in context, the world says about 5 million, or said till a few months ago, that 5 million people have died globally. Analysis, our analysis combining ground reports and what epidemiologists have studied suggests that 5 million people may have died in India alone. So what the global death count is, officially, is likely the actual death count of India alone. Now this became a huge journalistic fight to cover these cremations. Those of us who did were called vultures. We were told we were feasting off the dead. Uh, we were threatened. We were called sellouts to our country because we covered these cremations. Well, in fact, covering these cremations was, and funerals and burial grounds was the only way to understand what was happening in terms of the gap between the official number and the actual number. And let me give you a small example. This cremation ground had cremated 300, 300 people in a particular week, in a particular district. And in that week, in that district, the official count was 20. If I had not gone to this cremation ground, I would not have known that. Also, this need to look away from these images, this need to sanitize the coverage, uh, the pressure 
I actually, and we can talk more about it in the q and I disagree with it completely because I think that we needed that jolt to our system to understand the scale and the magnitude of what was going on. And in cremation ground after cremation ground, you had bodies like this lying on the floor because there was no one who was either sometimes able to take ownership and sometimes where there were families, there was no space at the cremation ground. And by the way, as I said, this happened to my own father. When my father died, we had to take him to the nearest cremation ground and we couldn't bring him back home because it would have meant crossing. He was technically in a different district, so I would have needed legal permissions to get him back. And when we went to that cremation ground, there were four families quarreling for that space because there was such a long line of people. And so, you know, we, we, we found ourselves doing that. And before that, uh, when I had to take the very difficult decision, I initially tried to treat my father at home. And then the doctor said, you must get him to hospital. And because we were panicked, uh, we called for an ambulance. The hospital ambulance was not available because it was, the hospital was overburdened. Somebody said, hey, I, I know an ambulance. You can get that ambulance. When that ambulance arrived, it was really a second-hand car that had been repurposed. Uh, you know, it was a little van. It had been repurposed as an ambulance. It had a driver. It had no medics. And it had one giant oxygen cylinder at the back. Now, I asked the driver, are you sure this works? Are you sure this works? Yes, 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 it works. I panicked. And I will share with you that till this day, I keep asking myself that if I hadn't sent my father in that ambulance, maybe he would have lived. And to that extent, you know, and I'm sure I'm not the only daughter who's haunted by this guilt, but I'm haunted by guilt. Did I do this to my father? And I can't imagine how many such conversations are being had in the hearts of how many such daughters in India. But I took the call of sending him, not just sending him, I was in that ambulance with him. I sat in the front seat. We raced to the hospital. The driver didn't know how to get to the hospital. I put on my Google Maps. It was surreal. The police were still trying to enforce the lockdown, so the ambulance kept getting stopped at these traffic snarls. I was tweeting the chief minister furiously, putting the video saying, we need a green lane for these ambulances. People are dying. Why do we have this police enforced lockdown? What is it doing? Anyway, we reached the ambulance, and suddenly the oxygen levels of my father at the emergency have plummeted, and we realized that that mask had not worked. The cylinder had not wor worked as it should have. There was something faulty in the flow, and so his oxygen levels fell. He was supposed to be admitted to a general room, but because his oxygen levels fell, he was taken straight into ICU. Uh, I was privileged enough, I have to say this here, my privilege allowed me to get him a bed, not without some begging, not without using my diary to call up every single doctor I know and manage that bed. So a lot of folded hands, but I was privileged and I was aware of my privilege that I was able to take him into an ICU. Most people that I had reported on were dying at the gates of closed doors or in the ambulances or on the street and I had seen that for months. So to that extent, I became that the story I was reporting and the only way I was able to cope with, if coping is the right word, with, what, with my loss is by isolating in my basement for 14 days and then getting up and going to report the story again. That's the only thing I knew how to do. And we were in the midst of a raging controversy, which we still continue to be, over exactly how many people had died. This is a drone footage of the banks of the Ganga River in India. It's uh, our most worshipped river. It's also one of our uh, longest rivers. What do you think that is? Bodies. Those are bodies. The bodies just scattered. That's an aerial view. This is what it looked like on the ground. So what we did was we started going to these riverbanks. We did it, and a lot of sterling work was done by a lot of the regional press in India, uh, because this is when local really matters, what your local network is, to be able to reach places that you know city dwellers don't even know about unless you sort of make it your life to go. You know, I went... I went to about five of these banks, but they're very uh, remote. They're at the edges of cities. Uh, it's where cremations usually take place. But remember that this, these were bodies that were being abandoned. These bodies were being abandoned. No, th this wasn't like a family coming and cremating their dead. They were like mass shallow graves. So you had bodies either being thrown into the water or being buried in the sand and just being left. And when we tried to investigate more, why was this happening? Uh, we came up with two or three reasons. One, people were too poor, again, uh, the economic uh, so, uh, sort of consequences uh, to afford the wood that is needed for a cremation. But there was also huge stigma. 
we had managed uh, in large parts of India to have continued stigma uh, around COVID. And so people didn't want anybody to know that somebody in their family had died from COVID. So when it, when it would get dark, they would go and they would just leave the body in, 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 in the riverbank with that orange saffron, which is called the Ram Nami cloth, which is a kind of a religious uh, Hindu uh, cloth. This is what these banks look like. So in some cases, you had families accompanying the body, but mostly it was a wasteland of bodies and bodies. To get to these places, there was no road. You sometimes had to clamber onto a motorcycle. Sometimes you had to go by boat because you were basically exploring what was happening along the river. And as I said, it was nothing short of mass shallow graves of abandoned bodies. And this is why by computing and comparing official data with these images, with what was happening locally, there is now an estimate that between four to five million Indians have died in the two years of COVID. Other inequities that we've been talking about, I discovered in the course, I'm ashamed to know I didn't know it before, that there was actually something called, a community called body washers, both in Muslims and Hindus, before a body is cremated or buried, uh, the body is bathed, it's washed. So this was a Muslim family we met in Hyderabad and they spoke of the discrimination that they were facing because they were the only ones ready to touch a body that had COVID. And they weren't doing this from altruism, they were doing this from their consigned place in the social hierarchy, which is the very bottom of the economic and uh, caste hierarchy. And there, and this man was so proud when he showed me his ID card. He had an ID card that said, dead body washer. And it just reinforced the gap between the lives that we live and the lives that the mass of Indians are actually living without even any public gaze or public commentary. So first, poverty drove them to have to wash these bodies that of, of, of people who had died from COVID, and then they were discriminated against for that. In front of me in, in, in Varanasi, which is again considered a holy city for Hindus, it's also the prime minister's constituency, we had these young boys who were body washers, and as I was talking to them, I saw the shopkeeper shoo them away, basically saying that you're too impure because you touch bodies, get away from here, get away from here, we don't want you near our stores. So here you had this service being done, by these people when nobody else, in, you know, because of the stigma, was often ready to touch these bodies. And for touching these bodies, we saw uh, them being socially discriminated against. We also saw in these, two, in these two years an increase in poverty. 230 million Indians, 230 million Indians were pushed into poverty in the first year alone. We don't yet have the numbers for the second year. We also found ourselves questioning things that were considered very sensible, but when you applied them to Indian reality, made no sense at all. So let me give you a small example. Stay at home, stay safe, stay at home. What does that mean for a country where you have 75% of Indians with an average family size of five living in less than two rooms? What does it mean to tell these people to stay at home? What does it mean to tell people to socially distance in one of the biggest slum tenements in Asia, Dharavi, where there are 8,000 community toilets for 850,000 people? So I think what COVID has done for us, and let me, you know, I haven't even dwelled on the fact that we've had one of the biggest physical school lockdowns in the world. We have only just begun to open schools after two years. Uh, we have had millions of children fall out of the school system. We have had girls under 18 under renewed pressure to be given away in marriage because they have no schools to go to. Um, and so there is renewed pressure. The families don't, they want to save money. They want to send the girls away. We have uh, survey after survey telling us that our children have suffered in cognitive uh, skills, in language skills, in social skills, and we've only just begun to open schools. And where there were schools were being run digitally, uh, just another figure, only 11% of India has access to a computing device. So what does digital education mean? So I could go on, but I just uh, want to not close, but pause at this point to say that 
I discovered a lot about my own elitism in the course of reporting this story. It, it, it isn't just me standing here and being judgy about the government or about everybody else. Uh, it was my own journalism that suddenly seemed to fall short. Uh, you know, I didn't know, for example, that there was a village less than an hour from where I lived where when we were telling people to continuously wash their hands, I had never paid attention to the fact that millions of Indians didn't have access to running water. And when I went to this village, uh, I saw that the water was yellow. So I said, what's going on here? And then the, the villagers sort of, unf you know, put their sleeves up and they showed me these kind of bruises, rashes, allergies. And it turned out that the water was yellow uh, because of a sort of industrial pollution in the area. And uh, so the water was contaminated, so it couldn't be had to drink. So they would spend 10 rupees buying mineral water because there was no other source of drinking water. And in the middle of a lockdown, how do you do that? But even to just wash your hands, you couldn't wash your hands with that water because it was, you know, it was contaminated. There was another village, urban village, which you could only get to by boat. And it was at the border of Delhi and Noida. Noida is in Uttar Pradesh. It's one of our big industrial new cities. And there's a part of that village where there's no road. And nobody can answer why there is, nobody has built that road. But there is no road. And so therefore, for these people to get to a hospital, they have to first get onto a boat, get to the shore, and then find a way to, you know, uh, it's not a very long boat ride, admittedly. It's, it's you know, and that makes it even more peculiar that nobody in all these years uh, has, has, has built a road. But these were the stories that I never used to report on. I used to think of them as features. Who wants to do social issue reportage? You know, it's the soft stuff. And there was so much sort of self-consciousness about being female and doing the hard stories that my attention was completely taken up by, you know, covering conflict and covering war and covering insurgencies. And, and that's where I cut my teeth. And, and then I was so acutely aware of both my shortcomings as a journalist. I, 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 I hoped to have compensated for some of those shortcomings, but also of my complete privilege a privilege that I don't even pause to think about on a daily basis. And I, I finally wrote a book, I'll pause there, called The Humans of COVID, because I think that what we have done is flatten out this tragedy to make it about numbers. It is about people. It's about tragedy. It's about hope. It's about heartbreak. It's, it's about all of us. And yet, it's actually about the millions who don't have a voice in the system. Uh, and who are totally dependent on the system and who can't use their network of connections to get a hospital bed as I could do for my father and still lose him, but I was still privileged. And I think again and again by those orphaned by the state who we have invisibilized. And COVID reinforced the invis invisibilization of millions of Indians. And therefore, it was not the great equalizer. It was the mirror that we couldn't bear to look ourselves in. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Barker. Incredibly powerful uh, story, and I think a reminder of the essential task of seeking truth and reporting it. Um, I think it's been a reminder also for those of us uh, that even those who've had several Zoom funerals in the last uh, two years uh, have still had a relatively very privileged pandemic. Um, I wanted to ask you a question uh, that really sort of picks up on where you ended. Uh, I think you were very powerful as shown us some of the issues around the science side of this and how politics can um, shape also official statistics sometimes. But I wonder whether you want to say a little bit more before we open up for, for questions here about how you think about the role of journalism yeah. in this crisis. Um, here in the UK, um, we did research during the uh, first six months of the coronavirus crisis where in the summer of 2020 when we surveyed people in the UK uh, and asked them about their perception of the role of journalism in news media just 7% uh, said that they felt that news coverage had made the crisis better. Mm -hmm. um, about half were indifferent. And 35% said that they felt the news coverage had made the coronavirus crisis in the UK worse. 
Um, how do you think about the way in which Indian media covered the pandemic, and do you think it made the crisis better or worse for the people that you covered yourself? Thank you. Um, that is a very important question. And talk a little bit, I mean, I did mention briefly that I just started this digital platform and we were a team of four. Uh, but before I get to the general public skepticism and lack of faith in journalism and how we performed, uh, it's important to talk a little bit about technology and what technology has made possible. The fact that we were all forced into virtual worlds, strangely, opened up for the first time, if ever there was a level playing field, there was no other level playing field, but if there was one level playing field, it was in journalism. Because what it meant was that suddenly, if you told your guest, I'm sending you a link, can you join me? They didn't think of you as a small guys. Everybody was sending them a link to join them. It was completely normal to Zoom or Skype or, you know, we use something called StreamYard or whatever it is that you use, right? It was suddenly totally normal. Secondly, uh, big media, big broadcast stations in the beginning were not willing to take the risk to put boots on the ground. So intriguingly, this became a very, very fine moment for digital platforms, for independent uh, publications, and for uh, the oft used but never celebrated stringers. That's an industry term uh, for local freelance reporters who are literally paid peanuts uh, but are your go-to person because you know nobody people have cut costs in media you know there aren't bureaus everywhere so you're dependent on stringers so local reporters independent storytellers really shone and i think big media broadcast not newspapers so much really missed missed their uh, sort of duty as it were as, as, as storytellers and mediators in a crisis in the first wave. The second wave was distinctly different. We had a lot more reportage from everybody, from the newspapers, from the television stations, everybody. Uh, but journalists were vilified. We were vilified, we were attacked, we were called traitors, we were called treacherous. Why? Because we tried to get some sense of how many people had actually died. It also brought home, uh, and I think a lot of Western media has had to confront this, uh, local media and local newspapers have been dying, but actually we were never as dependent uh, on the local press as we were in this pandemic, uh, in particular the language press. Uh, the English media in India has long uh, again been, had disproportionate influence. Uh, we represent or we speak a language that only 3% of India speaks uh, uh, and yet we are the ones that influence policy and shape government and so on. But uh, in particular, I'd like to name uh, two newspapers, the Dainik Bhaskar and the Gujarat Samachar, uh, without whom uh, these mass uh, graves and the actual disparity in the death count would never uh, have been uncovered. And uh, you know, it's, it, Gujarat was a particularly sensitive story. It's the Prime Minister and the Home Minister's home state. It was tough for a language newspaper to do the story, but they did. So in some ways, it was really some excellent journalism, especially in the second wave. But now let's come to your question. If you asked people, people love to hate the media. And some of those reasons are good reasons. And some of those reasons are because we live in such polarized times that if the media does not, or if a journalist does not immediately confirm or reconfirm your own bias, you say to the journalist, there's a problem. She's biased. Why is she writing a column in the Washington Post? I get asked this all the time. Why do you have to say this in the Washington Post? Can't you say it in an Indian newspaper? Like in a globalized, digitized world, anyway, we we're all consuming it on our tablet, the geography of it matters, right? Uh, I think it was an incredibly tough time to be a journalist, but an incredibly powerful time to be a journalist. And basically, it depended on what you made with that, uh, with that opportunity uh, to do your job. But I would say public trust in the media, you're not going to get uh, the surveys. If you did them in India, you'd get even worse results. I'll say two things as we open up for questions. The first one is that my role uh, is to make sure that we get as many different questions and different voices uh, as possible. And the second thing I'll say is that I know it's very rude to point, but I will point because it's also very helpful so we can get a mic to you. Um, so please, um, take it away. I have a, a question here.
Thank you. Uh, hi. Th hi. Uh, my name is Toral Gathani. I'm a surgeon and an epidemiologist, and I've done some. Uh, I've worked in India in a research capacity for many years. Do you have any data? I'm interested about the the, the death counts. Mm -hmm. Do you have any data about any disparities between Hindus and Muslims in in that, and whether Muslims were particularly disadvantaged during the pandemic, and particularly under this particular government? Um, two things on that. My sense is that uh, the Muslims fall back in the socioeconomic indices anyway. In other words, on average, uh, a Muslim is more socially, economically, and educationally backward than the average Hindu. So therefore, if poverty is that central fault line along which this virus impacted people differently, then uh, while there has been no separate survey that has been done on this that I can quote, anecdotally, my sense would be that poorer people suffered much more. And Muslims, because they're a poorer community, by definition, would have suffered more. The other thing I didn't mention because it didn't fit in the framework of this conversation, uh, two things that could be germane to religion. In the first wave, we had uh, a religious congregation called the Tablighi Jamaat, which is spread across South Asia, take place in Delhi as well. And so you had these people coming in from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from other countries, and they had a congregation in Delhi. And that event proved to be somewhat of a, of a super spreader, but that was a time when the borders of India hadn't been closed, and so you, know, you didn't have these restrictions. There were some guidelines in place to not have gatherings of more than 200 people, but the lockdown had, uh, you know, you didn't have all of these sort of, this public health emergency that had been declared. So by all accounts, of course, it was wrong to hold that congregation, but it wasn't the only such congregation that was held. That unfortunate moment became a moment to vilify all Muslims. Um, there were television channels, I should have mentioned this. There were television channels that had a hashtag called Corona Jihad. Hashtag Corona Jihad, yeah, uh, to basically, and this is uh, uh, one of the most powerful television channels in the country. I'm not talking about a fringe channel. I'm not talking about some loony podcast. Mainstream, prime time, highly watched channels. There was another channel that uh, represented uh, the graphics and the statistics of those who had died using a skull cap. So the numbers were put in a skull cap, right? So that is obviously extreme bigotry. And uh, we did see uh, it for a phase in the first wave being used to vilify Muslims. Uh, mercifully, we moved on from that point, but it did take place. Here in the front row, please. Thank you so much, that was really an absolutely incredible talk. Um, my name's Amy, I'm actually a medical doctor from South Africa, and looking at some of these images, it actually brings back a lot of my own emotions and trauma that I experienced because I see so many similarities between the Indian setting and the South African setting. I mean, we have, firstly, a mass amount of excess deaths as well, like you picked up. We, I mean, I can remember when our government announced its lockdown and all of my colleagues and I just burst into tears because we didn't know what it would bring. Um, and I mean, as you say, you, you tell people to stay at home, but South Africa's structure is that the majority of our people live in townships and shacks. And how can you tell people to isolate like that? And, and we, we had also an extremely draconian lockdown where public transport wasn't working, provinces were locked down, you weren't allowed to buy alcohol, uh, you weren't allowed out of your house at all. Um, I, I, Peculiarly, though, it was the first, well, the only country in the beginning to have a negative death rate, mm -hmm. because by locking it down, it reduced violence, mm -hmm. <laughs> and by stopping alcohol, it reduced violence, but <laughs> obviously then it, it picked up again. But, I mean, we saw exactly the same, the hospital shortages, people with other conditions just not able to get treatment. We ran out of oxygen. We just saw people dying all the time. Um, and so, I, you know, personally, I experience a lot of emotional trauma dealing with that, and I can see that you've experienced exactly the same. So I, I'm wondering, you know, how do you deal with this mental trauma, and how do you go from reporting that and just, you know, continue living life? Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for sharing that, and it's, uh, it's, it's a great question. I think you are perennially, uh, you, you live with this guilt. 
I, I, I feel guilty at all times, you know, and I don't just feel guilty because I placed my father in that ambulance. I feel guilty for being so elite. I feel guilty for who I am or who I was just by an accident of birth lucky enough to be. Uh, I, uh, in the first wave, you know, I had to really struggle to get food and a place to stay. But in the second wave, I would go in and, and report all of these stories of extreme trauma and the hotels were open and I would go back into a completely plush hotel. I mean, when I say plush, I mean just like a regular hotel, but plush by the standards of what I was seeing. And, and, and be able to have a glass of wine at the end of the day to de-stress. And there was such dissonance in those realities. And I don't want to stand here and pretend to you that I stopped living my, my life because I'm still living it, but things changed. I don't remember the last time I slept six hours. I, ju I just don't remember. And I can't offer a reason for it, except that I just can't sleep. That these names are just forever embedded in my heart, that I don't actually need to refer to any notes. I don't have a scrap of paper. I didn't write down anything I said, because they're like my fellow travelers in this journey. And, and you just feel so guilty. I don't know if that makes any sense. You just feel overwhelming, useless, unproductive guilt. And you just have to take that guilt and create something from it and do something with it. But am I mentally damaged from it? I'm absolutely mentally damaged from it to the extent that it has made me question. Uh, I'll give you a small example. We didn't get to talk about this. But in the first wave, uh, sorry, in the second wave, India continued to go through elections, which meant that while we were putting people in lockdown, our politicians were addressing mass rallies and campaigning. Our schools were closed, but our polling booths were open. It's so egregious, right? And I took the decision at, at my platform, at the Mojo Story, that I would not report on the elections. I've never done something like this. I'm, I'm like a news junkie. I'm like, I live for news. But I was so morally offended by the fact that those elections were taking place and those mass rallies were taking place that I felt that by reporting them, I would be contributing to the norm normalizing of it. And so I find that COVID has been, or reporting this has been transformative, and it has really made me reprioritize the, the issues I want to spend my time on as a journalist. And I'm OK to not have suddenly not get the big political interviews because everybody's pissed off with what I've said in my coverage, and they don't want to talk to me. It's OK. Four years ago, it would have bothered me. So it changes you. Thanks, Parker. We have a question here in the fourth row. Yeah. Hi, Vika. Maraj from Hi, Maraj. Mr. How are you? Good to good see, you. see you. Again. So you. How are you? Good, good. Uh, so, uh, first, thank you for this presentation. I mean, I know how hard it is not only to cover this stuff, but even to talk about it. I've seen the toll it has taken in my own newsroom. So, thank you for that. So, uh, there's a lot written about, a lot talked about how all this in injustice, all this suffering, all this obscene inequality is a result of political crisis, economic crisis, which it is. But you have been covering these issues for a long time. So do you sense at, at some fundamental level, this is also a moral failing, a moral crisis stemming somewhere from the caste system, as you alluded to in your talk? And if so, how can you address all these political and economic and social problems without addressing that basic fundamental problem? It's a great question. Uh, I actually think that COVID is about power. If you, if you had to actually summarize it, it is about the structure of, it's about how power is organized in our, con in, in our country at least, right? Uh, how, what, what can the poor access? Within the poor also there is a, there's a hierarchy. Like I said, the body washer, that's why I ended with, with his story, right? Uh, so. There is, a moral, there is a moral dimension to it. There's something morally egregious about the fact that Instagram was full of how to bake banana bread and holidays from Maldives. And I'm not being like you know, some set piece lefty here and saying, hey, don't go and have a good time. I, I, like I said, I'm still living that, that life of you know, taking a vacation when I want to. But just the juxtaposition of it all happening at the same time. You know, people's lockdown diaries being filled with sort of I mean, this was the most privileged thing we heard out of Delhi. We live in a very polluted city. Uh, when, when the city locked down, uh, the sky cleared up, and people did Instagram posts about COVID blue. We actually named the color COVID blue. I mean, this is how tone deaf we can be. And I say we, because I'm pretty sure that had I not been out there seeing this, I'd probably have been doing the same, because I'm from that class. 
So of course there's a moral failing, but I don't know whose failing it is because it's an institutional failing. It's the way power is structurally organized. And, and the really sad thing is people aren't even angry. When you talk to India's poor, there is such a deep sense of fatalism, like this is what they were meant to live, that there isn't even rage. I would be so angry. I'm angry when, 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 when you know, you, we go to a hospital and you, know, you wait for one hour, you feel angry. These were people dying on the streets, of, on the streets and, and they're not angry. They just internalize it in this resigned way and it's tragic. It is tragic. There's a question here at the back. Thank you so much for uh, all your work and speaking to us today. Um, this is a bit out of scope from what you've precisely covered, but um, you've made the point that geography is really important uh, in India in general, but of course in how it impacted, how COVID impacted people. Um, could you give us some insight into how do you, how you think or um, what you may have seen uh, in Kashmir and, and how COVID and lockdown played out over there? Um. I don't know that we saw something specific to Kashmir, other than the fact that I would imagine that where there is uh, already a sort of police enforced lockdown in the rest of the country, uh, that would apply to a situation where there is often a tense sort of collision between people and, 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 and at least in the, in the valley. Um, but I don't know that it played out any differently. I don't know that it played out any differently. Uh, I do believe that one of the things that happened overall was that people got excuses to be what I call tin pot dictators. So let me give you an example, like housing societies, resident welfare associations. People suddenly started imposing strange kind of rules. So in the first wave, for example, we had massive discrimination against health workers, right? So if you had nurses and doctors, and I already spoke about in, in, if for a phase there was a stigmatization against Muslims, but I, I don't think it was particular to Kashmir. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. So you had housing societies lock out people and say, go and live somewhere else. People were, you had people lock up public parks. So COVID has sometimes also provided a cover for a lot of completely irrational decision making, which is then attributed to being pandemic times. And suddenly that interface that you have to be able to question things in a regular sort of way, you just told, but hey, it's COVID. So I'm sorry, I don't have a particular Kashmir uh, sort of context to provide you, uh, but in general, this is, this is my sense, that we are going to have to live for a while to uh, reclaim our argumentative democratic responses to a lot of um, flexing of authority all the way from housing societies to the tops of government, which we had to just internalize and suck up because it was COVID times. So I know that's not a Kashmir specific answer, but I, can't, I didn't see anything that's Kashmir specific in the COVID context that I can speak about, so I don't want to force an answer. Time for maybe one uh, last question before we start wrapping up. So I'll take one here. Robin, I'm a, I'm a Royce Institute fellow and I'm a journalist as well. Um, <coughs> uh, I did a lot of reporting on the pandemic as well uh, in a kind of similar way to you, but in the UK, so not on any kind of level um, or kind of scale um, as, as you're reporting. Um, but I found, um, and, and a lot of the things you said about, um, about it staying with you and, um, you know, in changing you, that, I, I had those experiences as, as well. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about, uh, and it's something that, if, that happened to me, and I'm sure it will have, have happened to you uh, much, much more, more than me. Um, you, I, had a, I, I kind of had a bit of a backlash to my reporting from the authority, you know, from the government, um, who you know, didn't always agree with the line that I was taking on, on, on the things I saw. Um, and obviously, you know, you were seeing, you were having a situation where the government, the story that the government was telling was very different to what you were seeing. It, you know, your reporting was uh, at the opposite end of the scale to what the government was saying. Did you feel 
either under pressure from the government to report it in a certain way, or did you, yeah, was, was there any kind of backlash from the authorities? Well, well, not, not formally, like, not that someone from the government called me, but in, 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 our, in our part of the world, uh, a lot of the, um, the backlash is organized through online trolling. Uh, and, you know, uh, sort of the way they vilify you is by questioning whether you're a patriot, um, making up things, like just falsifying things. Um, and so there was a lot of that. There was a lot of that. Uh, you know, I just kind of skimmed it over saying we, we were called vultures. But like literally imagine opening your phone. I have, you know, 7.2 million people who follow me on Twitter and like one day, more than one day, you're the top trend because the right-wing groups have all got together to troll you and you're the hashtag and you're being called a prostitute and a vulture and a traitor and an anti-national. And this happens on a regular basis and you just, uh, you know, I, I mean, I always remember this line from a Hillary Clinton interview I did eons ago and she said, you know, if you're a woman in the public space, you have to have a skin as thick as the hide of a rhinoceros. Uh, I thought I had that and then some and then I grew some more in these two years. So there was definitely backlash. Well, I think we're all mighty glad um, that you did that. Um, I mean, I'm going to sort of show that uh, I've learned from what you said towards the end, and I'm not going to be one of those tin pot dictators, because uh -huh. if I was, we would carry on all night. I could listen to you all night, but I'm not allowed to, and I respect the checks and balances of this college. So I will just say thank you to Mira Selva, my colleague, for helping organize this, thank along with you. myself. Thanks to the college and Michael for, for having us, Oxford Famogenesis for sponsoring us. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, Barca. It's been an absolute pleasure.